okay yeah i think yeah we are it's 5 31 so i, I think we can start uh, okay. uh hi everyone uh I, I'm Upal. I'm serving as the chair of IEEE Computer Society San Diego chapter for this year. And I'd like to welcome uh, everyone to the third talk of the invited seminar series organized by our chapter. Today's talk is co-sponsored by IEEE Young Professionals Affinity Group, IEEE Women in Engineering Affinity Group, and the IEEE Control System Society chapter of San Diego section. It's my Great pleasure to introduce Professor Emily Hahn from the University of Nevada, Reno. Emily received her PhD degree from the University of Maryland College Park in 2018 and joined UNR. Her primary research interest lies in the intersection of computer vision and machine learning with an emphasis on understanding human perception. She has performed uh, on several IRPA projects related to face recognition and ac action recognition from images and video. Her research focuses on bridging the gap between human and computer vision using research in human perception and machine learning. Emily is the director of the Machine Perception Lab at UNR. The MPL has active projects in computer vision, natural language processing, and machine learning. Emily's research is funded by several active grants through the National Science Foundation. She's very passionate about teaching and is a part of several NSF, REU, and RET programs at UNR. Uh, Emily, thanks a lot for being with us today. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, what a nice intro. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so I'm just gonna minimize that um, and hopefully everybody can see my screen and I'm just gonna get started. So. Uh, for this talk, I, uh, I gave uh, Upal a title of using human perception to inform machine perception. Um, usually my talk titles are, are making life accessible because that's kind of what we try to do in my lab. Uh, but like you said, my name is Emily Hand. Um, I'm an assistant professor in computer science and engineering at, at UNR. And let's see if we can get this. There we go. Um, and I am the director of the Machine Perception Lab, where we try to combine research in machine learning and human perception to improve understanding of both. Um, and so this is our sort of lab logo, and I like to take a second to talk about it, because typically when you talk about machine learning or, or machine perception, you see like brain logos and, and artificial brains and things like that. And we've just got a paper airplane. Um, and the reason for that is we're really trying to um, build wearable systems for individuals with social skills deficits to improve their social interactions in their lives. And we do that through machine perception, whether that's visual or audio or otherwise. Um, and so the idea is that we all kind of start with the same piece of paper and we can all fold it into a paper airplane that can fly, right? It can, we can repurpose our starting point um, to make something that allows people liberty and freedom in their lives. Um, and so, like I said, our long term goal really is to develop a wearable device for people with social skills deficits. And what does that look like? So we generally speak about people that are on the autism spectrum when we talk about social skills deficits. Um, but it could be any number of things it could be individuals with with face blindness. It could be individuals with um, ADHD. We also include in this group of people um, individuals with visual impairments, whether it's a visual impairment they've had their whole life or something that they've recently had. Um, and so we want to be able to develop these wearable devices that will in real time provide feedback on social interactions, because a lot of the work in accessibility focuses on people getting from point A to point B, which is very essential, obviously getting to work and doing things like that, right, is really important. But most of our life, right, isn't about getting from point A to point B, it's really about the social interactions that we have. And so to have a really rich life, um, it's important to be able to have realistic social interactions. And so that's our long-term goal. And how do we address that? Well, we are working on the back end pieces of that. And that involves computer vision, natural language processing, and machine learning. Um, but in this talk, I'm going to focus pretty much just on the computer vision aspect with some of the machine learning. Um, I left some of the natural language processing stuff that we're doing out of this talk. So for our research directions, most everything covers these four pillars. Uh, the first one is adding common sense to machine learning, learning from noisy data, explainable machine learning, and bias and fairness in machine learning. And I'm just going to review these really quickly before I dive into some of our projects. 
And I will say that I'm going to talk about some really old projects and some new projects. So it'll really span the whole time I've been working on this. Um, so first, adding common sense to machine learning. We really try in our work to add common sense to all of our machine learning applications. And so rather than, you know, just using machine learning for what it is, right, and, and, and using statistics, we also try to add world knowledge and common sense to our models, the way that they're trained, the way that they're evaluated. And so I'll talk about that as I talk about our projects. The second one is learning from noisy data. When you think about noisy data, a lot of times you think about like a noisy signal like this and trying to figure out, you know, what the actual signal is, right? Maybe this blue signal is the real, the true signal. And we've got this sort of red noisy signal as well as this pink noisy signal. But realistically, what we're dealing with, right, is yeah, a lot of the time. And so we're trying to describe people. So one example might be that we search, we do a Google search for a blonde woman. And the first thing you might notice that the, there's a couple of brunettes in here. And so if you were to just scrape this data, it wouldn't be perfectly clean, right? So we wouldn't be guaranteed that every woman that we scraped was blonde. In addition to that, you might notice that almost all of these women are white. And so that's another issue, right, of dealing with this kind of noise. And so we try to be able to take this information, which is noisy, but there's valuable signal in it and learn from that, but not learn everything from it. And then realistically, when we're talking about building wearable devices that can provide feedback to people, it's we need to be able to handle the noisy world, right? The world is noisy. There's a lot going on. And so we focus a lot on being able to handle noisy data in these systems. The third one is explainable machine learning. So in addition to adding common sense and learning from noisy data, we want to be able to explain what we're working with. Um, and so this really involves just kind of pulling back the curtain on these black box systems in a number of ways. One is right post hoc processing, being able to really explain when and how the method works. Um, and the other is incorporating explainability into the training of the model, right? So making sure that the model itself is explainable um, rather than just trying to pull back the curtain afterwards. And then finally, we try to address bias and fairness in machine learning as much as possible. And basically in every project we do, we're very cognizant of this. And that's because we're working with people's personal data and we're working with face data and image data. And because of that, we wanna make sure that our system is fair and, and as bias free as possible. And so this really is just about making sure that anyone that's trying to use this system has a good experience with it, right? And making sure everybody's represented properly. And so we want to make sure, you know, we're dealing with bias, but we're also being fair to all of these uh, users that might be using the data. So before I dive into my projects, I'm going to give a little bit of background that's kind of important to understand what exactly we're doing and what kind of data we're working with. So a lot of what we do is um, working with describable features. Um, so we're interested a little bit less in recognizing people and a little bit more in recognizing what people look like. There's a sort of a subtle distinction there. So we're not really that interested in verification or face recognition. We're much more interested in being able to take a face and say what that person looks like, right? So actually having this sort of describable features is really what we're focused on. And we do that through basically all of our work. Um, and so attributes are just human describable visual features. And we mostly work with facial attributes. So that's gonna be describable features of faces, which include things like gender, hair color, expression, face shape, facial hair, and many more. So these are all pictures of the same woman. Um, and so you might think that, you know, she looks pretty similar in all of these images, but you could separate her by her different attributes, right? So if you used wavy hair, you would have the negative instances on the left and the positive instances on the right. If you had smiling, you'd have negative on the left and positive on the right, and we'd have a completely different pairing than we did before. Similarly with bangs, right, it separates the data like this. And so we, we love this describability because it allows us to describe a person, but also to describe an image. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that later when we talk about using these types of attributes for face verification. But before we do that, we'll talk a little bit about the data set that we use for most of our work. We use this data set called Celeb A, 
It has 200,000 images, about 160,000 for training and 20,000 each for validation and testing. It came out in like 2015, 2014, 2015, something like that. And <clears throat> and it was the largest scale data set um, out there for facial attribute recognition, and it still is. And so each image is labeled with 40 binary attributes. Uh, what that means is either you're blonde or you're not, either you have um, high cheekbones or you don't, either you're smiling or you're not. And so that binary label causes some problems later on because there's really a gradient of these things. Uh, but we'll talk about that as we get into it. So to date, there's still no data set that's larger. Um, and so many people still use this data set, although a lot of people use this data set for um, training uh, generative adversarial networks, right? And trying to actually generate attributes rather than trying to recognize them. So our first project touches on these first three pillars, um, adding common sense to machine learning, learning from noisy data, and explainable machine learning. So if I were to ask you to picture this, right? A chubby male with straight hair, five o'clock shadow and arched eyebrows, you might quickly come with something in your mind. And although it might not be this exactly, this would maybe fit your description, right? So you wouldn't be surprised by seeing this. So I apologize for the color contrast on this image, but when I show it on an actual presentation, like on a, um, in, a in a room, it for some reason appears much darker, so it looks better like this, but on the computer, it actually looks very strange. Um, but anyway, you probably wouldn't picture something like this, right? This probably didn't come to anybody's mind. And there's a couple of reasons for that, right? The first one is that we use the word male, and a lot of times we don't use that word when we're talking about babies. We talk about babies by using the word baby or child. Um, the other thing is that they have a five o'clock shadow, which is another indication that they're not a baby. Um, and so we kind of use this common sense to understand what types of images and what types of people would fit this description. So we decided to in incorporate this, and this is actually work I did a very long time ago. We decided to incorporate this sort of common sense knowledge of faces into a model that was learning attribute relationships. So we did two things. The first thing is we actually grouped attributes by location. And so we combined pointy nose and wide nose. We combined mouth open, smiling, and big lips, which are all mouth related attributes. We combined all of our facial hair attributes, all of our eye related attributes, hair related attributes, and cheek related attributes together. And then we trained a model that used this physical representation to improve predictions. And then we added, in addition to that, an explicit and implicit attribute relationship network. So at first, right, we started with our network um, where we had shared representations of the lower layers, and then we separated out into different physical locations that would recognize certain attributes at those locations. And so this was a type of explicit attribute relationship learning where we explicitly modeled the physical relationships between attributes. And then we introduced this implicit attribute relationship learning, which we called our auxiliary network. And the idea here is, is if we know one thing about a face, it can help us to better learn something else. So if we know that an individual is wearing lipstick, for example, and we have a really high confidence of that, but for some reason we're wavering on whether or not they have a mustache, right? And so the model is sort of sitting around 50% on mustache. Um, we can use the fact that we're very confident about lipstick to maybe predict that this person likely doesn't have a mustache. And so that's what this auxiliary network is doing. And so we have our explicit model being fed into our implicit model and being all trained together to understand these explicit physical relationships and these Im implicit relationships between attributes. And then what did we learn? Well, we looked at the weights for this auxiliary network and we found a lot of really interesting relationships. So the first thing we found was that receding hairline and bald had a positive relationship. So on the surface, this seems like a good thing because receding hairline and bald do seem like they're related, but because these attributes are binary, we actually run into the problem where you either have a receding hairline or you don't, right? You either have hair or you don't. And so they really shouldn't have a positive relationship. They should have an inverse relationship. 
So if someone has a receding hairline, they should not have the label of bald. But what we found here is that this data set actually had some noise in it where people were labeling both bald and receding hairline for an image. We found chubby and double chin had a positive relationship, which makes sense. Heavy makeup and lipstick have a positive relationship, also makes sense. Necklace and necktie have an inverse relationship. So in this data set, that means that no one is wearing a necklace and a necktie at the same time. Um, does this mean it's impossible? No. Does it mean our model probably can't handle it? Yes. And then we also find that straight hair, wavy hair, and bald have an inverse relationship, which we're happy with because you should only have one of those things given the binary uh, requirement. Another thing that we found is that smiling and high cheekbones had a positive relationship. So this was actually really interesting and it helped us realize that nobody really knows what it means to have high cheekbones. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So our next project that I'm gonna talk about addresses actually all four of our pillars, including the bias and fairness in machine learning. And this project is, is called Selective Learning. And this is really inspired, right, again, by human perception um, and by how babies learn, right? So babies, uh, there's been many studies, but one in particular um, studied how babies learn based on their base, basically on their, their visual interest in something. And so when they understand something, they sort of stop paying attention to it and move on to something else. But if they feel like they need to learn something, they look at it a lot. And so there's this idea of like, once you've figured something out, you don't have to pay any more attention to it. So it's very much like us, right? We have selective hearing, right? Um, where a lot of us, right, just hear the things that we think we need to hear and then we move on, right? And that never really goes away. It's all just about efficiency, right? And so we tried to incorporate this idea of efficiency in the way that babies learn into a machine learning model. Now, without going into all the details, we basically did this selective learning approach where we would take the data that we had from Celeb A, where a lot of things were really imbalanced. In particular, the label for bald was only positive 2% of the time in the data set, and the label for young was positive over 80% of the time. And so we took this approach of selective learning where we would grab many, many batches from within our batches that were balanced in some way. And through that process, we were able to build a model um, and evaluate it on a new data set that we had collected. This was back from my PhD where uh, we called this data set the UMD attribute evaluation data set. Um, so we had Celeb A. In addition to Celeb A, LFW was also labeled with attributes in the same paper. And then we introduced our evaluation data set, which was much smaller, but it was evenly balanced between every attribute. And we also searched for particularly challenging images such as bald women. And so we evaluated this and compared it with the state of the art. And so the blue model at the time was the state of the art and the green one was ours. And we outperformed the state of the art, which is all good and fine. We were very happy with that. But we really were concerned about this area here where both the state of the art model and our model we're getting around 50% accuracy. And if we're getting 50% accuracy on a binary problem, we're not really learning anything. So we decided to investigate some of these attributes and we found some really interesting things. So first one is oval face. Now it's anyone's guess which half is positive and which half is negative. It turns out that the ones on the left are labeled as positive and the ones on the right are labeled as negative. But an oval face, is actually a very specific measurement and it's only something that can be measured when someone is frontal facing. So in addition to being basically a frontal face detector, no one was taking these types of measurements when they were labeling the data. And so it's really a useless attribute. Now attractive, right? Another thing I don't think I mentioned about this data set is that all of these individuals are, are celebrities. Um, and for the most part, they're on the red carpet or some version of that, right? And so what it means to be unattractive is very unclear because they're all very good looking people. And so the ones on the left happen to be labeled as positive and the ones on the right are labeled as negative. It's anybody's guess why that is. Again, attractiveness is something that's very subjective. There are some quote unquote objective measures of attractiveness, including symmetry, but again, measurements were not used to label this data. So uh, and the next one that we looked at was high cheekbones, right? And you might actually be able to guess this one because all the people on the right are smiling. They were all labeled as having high cheekbones. So we decided to dive into this a little bit further. And we, re we learned that high cheekbones actually has to do with basically this, this 
fat in your cheek kind of being missing. And so this sort of divot down here and less to do with the fact that your cheekbone is actually physically high on your face. But what happens when people smile is that their cheekbones raise up, right? And so when you take a smiling photo, it for the most part looks like somebody has high cheekbones. And so again, this is much more of just another label for smiling. Arched eyebrows is another example of something that's just poorly labeled uh, because there's a lot of different art eyebrow shapes, but there certainly wasn't any measurement going on. And I doubt that there was enough information provided to the labelers for them to really do a, a solid job on this. And last but not least, we have lipstick. And actually it turns out the ones on the right were labeled as positive and the ones on the left were labeled as negative. Several of the people on the left are wearing lipstick and several of the people on the right are not wearing lipstick. So what ended up happening when we reviewed this data is that we realized that a bunch of male labelers were asked to label whether or not women were wearing lipstick and they had no idea. So <clears throat> this is a very challenging problem. Works very well for like red lipstick, right? But any kind of neutral colored lipstick, it's not that great. So this was actually a really informative study because it helped us identify how many noisy problems we were dealing with to this data set. And so it, it helped inform what we should do moving forward. And so for our next project, we focused on these two aspects, specifically learning from noisy data and explainable machine learning. And so we wanted to be able to clean up the data set a little bit, because even for these more objective attributes, some of the uh, data was still very poorly labeled. And there's not a lot of information, and by that I mean there's like no information, in the original paper for Celeb A to indicate how they did the labeling. It just says that they hired a professional labeling company, um, and then that's it. So what we did is we wanted to create a semi-automated method uh, for removing these noisy images, or at least for providing someone with noisy images that could then be reviewed rather than having to review all 200,000 images for every attribute. So what we did is we created these representative sets and we did this in an automated fashion. But let's start with facial, facial hair, for example. So we started with facial hair and what we found was we created a facial hair classifier that grouped the most confident facial hair predictions together and the least confident facial hair predictions together. So that is people most likely with facial hair and the people most likely without facial hair. And we created these representative sets out of each. And so the idea is that this representative set is a lot of different people with facial hair. This representative set is the opposite, a lot of people with no facial hair. Then what we did is we actually took noisy images and representative images or possible noisy candidate images, and we ran them through a verification system to see if they were the same. And so what we would do is we would compare one image, a possibly noisy image, with every image in the representative set, and we would predict whether or not they were the same or different. And if we found more often than not that they were predicted as different, we would flag those samples as noise. And through this process, we were able to automate, like automate the pruning process and remove a bunch of samples that were labeled incorrectly. So here's just an example of bald, right? This is just 10 random samples, but we removed something like 4,000 images. And only one person is actually labeled as bald. So if you think about removing all of these people from the bald category and this one, the amount of noise actually still goes down. And then we were able to remove wearing eyeglasses where a bunch of these people, right? These people were all labeled as negative and these people were labeled as positive. Now the question becomes, is this person wearing sunglasses or are they wearing a hat? And I really think that's more of a philosophical question that I can't answer. Um, and then we even male versus female was labeled incorrectly for some images. And so we were able to automatically prune that as well. And that was over a thousand images. And so for our next project, we actually focused on the ability of these attributes to be used for face verification, because we found in addition to all of the noise associated with this data, we also found that these attributes these particular 40 attributes were not descriptive enough. So we were able to use them to describe images, right? But they weren't really describing people. Um, and so they weren't really descriptive enough to do verification with them, which is part of the reason why they've kind of fallen out of popularity in recent years. When they first came on, you know, into the, the research 
scene in like 2008, 2009, facial attributes were touted as this new thing that we were going to use to describe faces and we were going to be able to fix all the problems with face verification by using these attributes, but they're not granular enough. And so we started working on a separate project, separate but related project where we're focusing specifically on caricatures. So I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I went to this like a boardwalk. So I grew up in the uh, northern Nevada area and I we used to go to Santa Cruz and we would go to the beach boardwalk and there would be caricature artists everywhere. And I don't know if this is like a normal thing in other places, but we would always get our caricature done. And a caricature really feels, when you get one done, it feels a little bit like a personal attack <laughs> because they typically highlight the things about you that you don't love. But what they're really doing is highlighting the things about you that make you unique, uh, which also sometimes happen to be the things about you that you don't love. <laughs> Um, and so a caricature is said to be a good caricature if it looks more like you than you do. And so there's this sense of it capturing your likeness. So here's a couple of examples, right? So first, this is Justin Trudeau, right? So there's a caricature of him and a real image of him. Now, if somebody walked in and looked like this caricature of Justin Trudeau, you would be concerned for their health. Maybe they had been stung by a bee or something because humans don't look like this, right? Um, and so you would be really worried, but at the same time, when you see it, you can see him in it, right? It doesn't look like what a human looks like, but it captures his essence, right? It captures the things about him that make him him. It sort of captures his unique eyebrows, his sort of long nose, his very flat ears, his floppy-ish hair, and his big lower lip, right? So it captures those things about him that are much more granular than attributes are. Similarly with Barack Obama, right? That's not what a human looks like. And yet it captures his essence, right? It's got his teeth, it's got his nose, it's got his ears, right? And his thick eyebrows, and then that chin, right? So it captures all of those things and you know it's him very quickly from looking at the caricature. Similarly with Morgan Freeman, right? Again, that's not what a person looks like, but it also somehow looks just like him. And then Mark Zuckerberg, similarly. So there's actually research in human perception that suggests that we store faces in memory in a caricatured format. And so there's this idea that what we do, right, is that we actually store familiar faces in memory in an efficient way. And an efficient way would be storing them by what they, what makes them unique. And if we can store them by what makes them unique, then we're really just storing sort of caricatured versions of people. And so, even though we have this caricatured version, it still captures the person's likeness. And now there's still room to improve a lot of these face verification systems on familiar faces. Humans are still better at recognizing familiar faces than machines are. And so there's something there, right? And we're interested in bridging that gap. And so here, for example, Emma Watson, right? We have five different caricatures and they're all very different, but they all highlight very similar things like the fact that her forehead is a little bit wide and a little bit tall in comparison to the rest of her face. Her chin is prominent, but not that big. This one kind of accentuates how big it is, but really it's more pointy and kind of forward. Um, her ears stick out a little bit. And so that's kind of indicated in a lot of these, right? And then her mouth has these sort of like little upward, um, things at the end of her lips. And so that's also represented here. So these kind of describable features could be used in addition to attributes to make these more verification friendly. And so how are people actually using caricatures right now in practice? Well, um, people are generally trying to take an image and generate a caricature, but they don't really have any means of doing that well. Um, and there's no end goal in sight. It's just like one of those computer vision problems where it's like, if we can, we might as well, but there's not really a reason for it, right? And so <clears throat> there has been some work using generative adversarial networks in producing caricatures. Now, the problem is the more, I, I would say realistic, but what I mean is like the more fine grained, right? And, and better looking, the caricatures get, the less they actually represent the original identity, right? So these ones on the right-hand side 
are very good. They look like good drawings, right, or good renderings, but they don't look anything like the person they're supposed to be representing. So in this process, a lot of people are really losing the point of the caricature, which is capturing that essence and that likeness. And so people are using data sets, and I'll talk about the data sets in a second, but they're using data sets where they have like one realistic image and then a bunch of caricatures of that person. And then they're just trying to generate caricatures of that person. But they're not really doing a couple of things that are really important. One is making sure that the image actually captures that person's likeness, right? So if you saw, you know, one of these images in particular, like this image of Johnny Depp, that doesn't look like Johnny Depp at all. Right. If I didn't know if it wasn't in the same row as Johnny Depp, I would just think that was some guy. Um, and so it's really important that when you see a caricature, you know exactly who it's of, uh, because if you do, then the likeness has been captured properly. And so a lot of times, too, they're working with things like this, where this this doesn't actually accentuate anything about Anne Hathaway that makes Anne Hathaway Anne Hathaway. And this isn't even really a complete drawing. So we have issues with the data that's being used mostly because people that are working on this problem are really just trying to generate caricatures for the sake of generating caricatures and they don't really care about what they're being used for on the other hand we're really interested in generating caricatures so we can better understand what people look like um so the biggest data set available for this and, and one of the most prominent works in this area is called web caricature and they collected a bunch of data scraping the web for caricatures um, and we put a random sampling of some of the images we didn't love in here. Um, so this is Anne Hathaway, but it really isn't a caricature. Her lips are just big. This is Bono, but it's not a caricature. It's just abstract. Similarly here with Bono, this is just a drawing of Bono. This is just a painting of Anne Hathaway and so on and so forth. So there's some quality control issues. But this is one of the bigger data sets available for this problem. There's 252 identities in this data set with roughly 6,000 caricatures and 6,000 realistic or veridical face images. We did some cleaning on this data, right? Removing any identities that didn't have, uh, we removed identities after we removed caricatures and vertical faces. We found that, you know, if we, we looked at each individual caricature and we had several people look at each individual caricature and if they couldn't figure out who it was with any amount of confidence, we removed it. So we almost removed half of the caricatures. And then we removed about 200 of the vertical face images. And what happened is we ended up with about 49 identities that ended up with either zero caricatures or zero vertical images. And so we removed those identities. In addition to cleaning that data set, we introduced our own data set, which we've called Carver or Caricature Verification Data Set, where we have at least five images, five vertical and five um, caricatured images per identity. Whereas in web caricature, there's only one guaranteed caricature per identity. And what we did is we had several labelers review every image. And if they couldn't figure out who it was, it was not added to the data set. And then we also made sure to incorporate a lot of different data from a lot of different people. And so we did uh, specific searches uh, to make sure that we were covering black people, Indian people, um, Asian people, and so on and so forth, so that we didn't just have a bunch of white caricatures. And our data set has 229 identities with 1600 characters and 3100 vertical faces. So part of our data set that's very unique as opposed to the web caricature data set is for every identity, because we're interested in using these caricatures to better understand what people look like and to use that for discriminate discrimination purposes so basically to discriminate two identities <clears throat> we needed to understand what makes them unique so rather than just collecting images and caricatures and guessing uh, we actually had three labelers label every identity with prominent features in the data set and so for example we have two identities here on the left the labels for what makes them unique is they have a well-defined tip of their nose, their ears stick out, they have pierced ears, they have arched eyebrows, puffy eyelids, bags under their eyes, a mustache and a goatee. So those are things that are sort of uh, continuous throughout their identity. So we would look at at least five images per identity to make 
these predictions, right? Because it's every image can be very different, but if you see many images of an individual, you can get a sense of what they generally look like. And then on the right-hand side, the labels for this were wide eyes, long eyelashes, hooked nose, thin nose, small head, full lips, and arched eyebrows. We had a huge list of labels. Um, some of them didn't get used and some people created new labels. And so there are some identities that have just one label and they're not used for anybody else. But we wanted to leave it as free form as possible so people could really describe the faces the way that they saw them. And so the first thing we did with this caricature data set is we tried to see if we could actually predict these prominent features. And we wanted to do it in a somewhat objective way, as much as could be done. And so we started by just taking facial measurements to see if we could recognize things like long nose, wide nose, wide eyebrows, small head, things like that. And so we started with, um, a uh, facial segmentation network and we segmented the parts of the face um, and we took those parts and we turned them into um, different labels and so we actually were able to calculate the distance between the eyes distance between distance sorry between the eyebrows the nose width and height the height and width of the eyebrows and so on and so forth and then we were able to use those measurements to predict different things like whether or not the eyes were widely set on the head whether or not they were narrow set whether or not people had wide nostrils or their nose was wide or thin, long or short, and so on and so forth. So we were able to predict quite a few things with this. And what we found is it actually worked very well in sorting the images. Now, we didn't get necessarily great numbers in terms of prediction accuracy on our data set. Uh, we did use, um, we used the uh, Celebe data set to calculate our distances. Um, and this is just a completely unsupervised method. So it was just thresholding basically on these distances. And so what we did is we sorted our data set of um, facial attributes from largest to smallest for each one of these things. And we found that in the, you know, at the top and the bottom, we were getting things that made sense. So this person has a very large forehead. This person has a wide nose. This person has very wide set eyes and so on and so forth. So we were able to actually identify quite a few people with very distinctive attributes. And so what we were able to do with this is take this and add this to our set of attributes from Celeb A and actually use it for face recognition. So instead of just doing plain face recognition, we were kind of interested in being able to search for images um, using text descriptions. And so this one in particular is a man with a long nose, narrow set eyes and gray hair, and it pulls back these images and we were able to find faces where the eyes are very close together, gray hair, um, and then long nose, and so on and so forth. So we use this more for search than we have really for verification, but they're very similar problems. Uh, Emily, so, uh, yeah. uh, there is a question on the chat. Do you want to take it now or at the end, like all together? I take it now. I just have no idea how to look at the chat. <laughs> <laughs> I can read it. Uh, okay. Yeah, so this is from Abhijit. He said, very interesting comment on neuroimpression of maintaining faces as caricature. Was caricature art styling an important attribute, say 2D versus ND caricature? Yeah, so it is really important. We haven't gotten to the point where we have enough data that we can separate those two things. It is very important and, and we know that it's gonna be a, an issue as we move forward. Um, because there are some caricatures that are just plain drawings and then there's some that are renderings and the renderings obviously are going to be much more useful because they're more detailed and they're they're more in the same domain as the realistic images. Um, but right now we're working on um, trying to see if we can predict the prominent features from the caricatures themselves and then we're going to try to combine the two methods and then from there we're actually interested in generating caricatures which will look much more like rendered ones and so that'll actually tell us through that process we'll definitely understand more the limitations of the drawn caricatures uh, but for now we just tried to have as many caricatures as possible because if you limit yourself to rendered ones you really really limit how much data you have to work with Hi, hi. Thank you so much, Emily. This is really helpful. Uh, one just addition. This is a bit, by the way. One additional thought. Um, have you looked into hint modeling where, you know, you, if you give a hint or, or an abstract uh, element of, let's say, Anne Hathaway uh, and, and the model is learning on, on the, the aspects of the hints to caricature for it to learn uh, mm -hmm. in, in context? 
So I haven't, um, I haven't uh, looked into that. That sounds really interesting, but it is something that we want to, I mean, along those lines, we do want to have like perspective, like human in the loop correction type thing. And so that sounds very much like something that we can look into and I think would be really useful. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Yes. Thank I you. Was, I was yeah. going in the, in the same direction. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so for our next project, it's related, um, but we we found that a lot of what makes the caricatures interesting is their their ability to capture someone's likeness. And so our next project really is focused on the first three pillars, where we're focused specifically on likeness. And we we define likeness in this aspect um, by doppelgangers. So that is people that really just look very similar, even though they have no business looking similar because they're not related necessarily. Um, so here's a perfectly good example. Um, Mike Tomlin um, is this coach for the Steelers. And then Omar Epps is an actor, which everybody probably knows him from House. Um, I'm sure he's been in a million other things, but that's the only thing I can remember him from. And so they, for some reason, look like the exact same person, um, even though they're not related and they probably don't even know each other. And so this is a good example of when you see someone, especially when you see someone for uh, the first time, you might say, oh, you know what? They remind me of so-and-so. And there's something about them that looks like this, right? And so we wanted to take this very human way of describing people and use it in a machine learning setting. And so we created a new data set of doppelgangers where we have over 200 doppelganger pairs, which includes lookalikes, siblings, as well as parents and children that look very similar. Um, and we created this data set and it's mostly for evaluation. But right now we're building a system of likeness-based attributes. So rather than focusing on caricatures specifically or on these 40 binary attributes that Celebe has, we're kind of creating our own. And we're doing this following kind of a protocol from like Tom versus Pete, if you've read that paper or heard of that work, which was a long time ago when they were doing sort of data-driven attributes. So we're starting with that, but we're using deep learning as the main mechanism for that. And then we're gonna move forward with describing faces in terms of other faces. So what we did is we created a bunch of likeness-based classifiers where we compared pairs of individuals and created classifiers for each. And then we test an image by seeing which person they get classified as. And we find you know, that maybe he looks more like the right-hand side uh, for the first pair, the left-hand side for the second pair, left-hand side for the third pair, and right-hand side for the fourth pair. And so this actually creates this sort of likeness vector, which tells us how much this person looks like one or the other in each pairing. And so this likeness-based vector can be used to predict um, can be used as a describer for this individual and can be used for face verification purposes. And we actually found just with this very simplistic method that this way outperforms facial attribute as facial attributes as features for face verification. Um, and that's just with this very simple approach. And so we've actually been able to use this to create a system that can identify your doppelganger. Um, and so we had a summer program where we brought in teachers and they were working on um, cybersecurity problems. And so we did like a face verification problem. And uh, this is one of our teachers, Kevin, and he created this demo, which uses this system and found that he looks like William Baldwin, which I don't think is too far off. So I um, thought that was cool. And we're still working on this. Uh, we're finalizing the data um, and making sure it's clean and ready to go. And we're submitting a paper on that uh, very soon. And so the data set will be available and we're still working on different approaches for these likeness-based attributes. Um, but basically that's just a couple of the projects that we have going in the lab. Um, we have quite a few other ones that I didn't have quite a lot of time to talk about, um, including really dissecting these models to understand if they're learning the same things that humans are learning in certain scenarios, which we found um, with one of our works, but didn't have time to include it here. Um, so basically we talked about describing faces, right? We talked about facial attributes, caricatures, prominent features, and likeness-based attributes, all as means of describing faces in the way that humans do, taking cues from human perception, and using those to improve the explainability and the actual performance of these verification models. So I wouldn't uh, be anywhere without my team. Um, some of my former students and some of my current students that have worked on these projects. 
Um, and that's all I have for you. So I'd be happy to take questions. Sorry if I rushed, I wanted to make sure there was time for questions. Thank you. Oh, perfect timing. Ah, thank you. Uh, Emily, thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, so if anyone has any question, uh, kindly unmute and ask. Not sure how to stop sharing. There we go. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, I in fact have one. The observation, the last work that you you showed, it, it mm -hmm. seemed a bit like the dictionary learning kind of approach, mm -hmm. right? You had, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, it, it's very interesting. So, so uh, Celebe is still like the the data set to go to for attributes. Yeah, it is, unfortunately. I mean, part of the problem is that there's a lot of problems. <laughs> so Celebe is still the data set because it's the biggest one. Some people have done some work on cleaning it. Some people have done some work on very specific aspects of it, like like fixing just the facial hair attributes and, and adding additional ones to really account for different things. Um, but that's the problem is it's so tedious to label that mm -hmm. many things for each image that no one's really come out with a larger data set or a cleaner version or anything like that. And so I think what really has happened is that people are just kind of working on different aspects of it and not necessarily just trying to predict attributes anymore. And we're not really trying to predict attributes anymore either because it's just not given that data, it's not helpful. And, and we've realized the issues with it in addition to like, they're just not discriminative enough. And so that's why we use the data, but for other things now, um, and so we, we've kind of expanded the definition of attributes to include all these other more discriminative things. But yeah, it's definitely still the data set and people use it more for like generating images now um, because there's such a variety of, of different faces and things but, like that. But being, being only like uh, captures of celebrity faces, isn't it inherently biased? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's a very, I mean, that data set itself is extremely biased, right? Because it's its all U.S. celebrities in Hollywood, right? And so there's a certain distribution for everything associated with that, right? Um, so it's definitely extremely biased. So one of the things, I mean, we try to do when we, and a lot of what we do is data collection because we're working on this and, and we don't want to use Celebe. <laughs> so we've collected like a bunch of like smaller data sets to use either for evaluation or just, you know, in addition for, to that. Um, and we try to focus specifically on filling the gaps that, you know, Celebe has when we do that. Hey, it sounds it's, good. it's really challenging because if you think about it, right, when you do data collection like this, right, you, you do just like a lot of Googling and scraping and it's like, we're Googling in the United States, so it's really yeah. hard. You have to do very specific type of searches to make sure that you're getting diverse data. But we, I mean, we do it. Uh, it's just, it's, it'd be nicer if we were collecting data from all over the world. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a challenge for sure. Anybody have any questions? Is there something in the chat? uh oh i see one question uh any use of facial angles in any of these uh works yes so in um in our caricature work um specifically in the prominent feature work um because we're taking multiple images of faces to predict prominent features um and most most of the time it's challenging to predict prominent features from an off frontal view. Um, so a lot of what we did, especially with the distance based learning, we used only frontal images. So we kind of, we didn't limit ourselves in the data collection process to only frontal images, but in the evaluation for that unsupervised method we did. Right now we're also building, uh, we're building a supervised method, um, both on just the regular images and the caricatures. And we're, we're exploring both um involving the the angles and and trying to ignore them <laughs> and so um because there's so little data we're having trouble with with both right because we don't want to get rid of any additional data but then the angles pose a significant problem um and so we're we're working on on approaches to that that'll be robust um to pose yeah that that was a question from charlie uh uh, about the facial angle. So yeah. Uh, one other thing. Uh, so this uh, 
text to image generators like mm-hmm. uh, dali i, I mm-hmm. it feels like they are those are doing a, quite a nice job at retaining all the facial attributes so they are mm-hmm. not training anything on celebe right those are full probably trained uh, some other way Oh yeah, they have to be because uh, I mean, celebe <laughs> is just so messy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so messy. There's just no way. Yeah. yeah, and so I think that's the thing is like a lot of people that are, um, a lot of systems that are are working really well are using some other data that like we're just not <laughs> privy to, you know, um, or they're like leveraging external data and then also maybe celebe at some point, but certainly not relying entirely on that data set. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I know a lot of people that are still working on attributes, right? That I see them at conferences and they tell me that they have a, a personal cleaned version of Celebe. And I'm like, why haven't you released it? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, it's all mine. Yeah. <laughs> so I know that some people do have done the work of cleaning it in some aspects. And so there there's certainly some people are working with cleaner data than we are. <laughs> Right. But I yeah. like the challenge of the noisy data. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, most data sets have some noise, but I think I think Celebre is particularly a bit too noisy. Like it's very I, noisy. Yeah, and so, so just in the last noise. couple of years, we've completely like moved away from it. We use it for some things, like for pre-training and things like that, and comparison. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, we don't we don't use it as our main evaluation tool or anything like that, um, because it's just too much. <laughs> So for the KV catcher data set that you've created, uh, so you mentioned that uh, caricatures are kind of uh, amplifying the like unique features of, of mm-hmm. a common person. So uh, how do we infer like what are the unique features of a person is from the caricatures? Like if you right. the the other. Right. right. So this is a good question and definitely one we want to answer. We want to be able to take we want to be able to do a couple of different things. So we want to be able to take a caricature and maybe make it a little bit more realistic. And we also want to be able to take a real image and kind of generate a caricature based on what we can identify as prominent about that person. Um, so going the uh, going the first way, right? Taking a caricature and making it more realistic is a much more challenging problem, I would imagine, um, than the other way around. And We haven't really approached that yet because our, for the most part, when what we're interested in doing is is identifying what makes somebody unique and then kind of exaggerating that because it because there's some research that shows we can recognize people faster if we do that. So if we have sort of a caricatured version of them, um, and so that'd be like you know for police sketches and things like that. But going the other way, um, we're I have a student right now. I have a a new student kind of trying to test that out and see if they can identify the prominent things. But the problem with that, which is probably obvious, is the artistic interpretation of these images, right? So two images, two caricatures can be wildly different, but still exaggerate similar things. So trying to figure out what the original face or the average face looks like it mm-hmm. from that can be very challenging. And one of the first issues that we've run into is how do you even align these spaces that aren't like faces? <laughs> and so we're working on doing that because it's like I mean, in the alignment like process. Generate yeah. the real face from the caricature. Somehow. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah a exactly. Very tricky problem. Exactly. Sense, but I feel yeah, like there's so many uh, interesting parts to that problem. So I think it's definitely something we're going to be trying to bite off one yeah. little bit at a time. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's a. I don't have a good answer for it. And I'm like fascinated to see how it goes. <laughs> Yeah, as we work on it. <laughs> yeah, so I see a couple of comments from Avijit. Uh, let's try generative hint modeling. Uh, he yes. wrote, and also noisy data is real world, so you are good there. Any data ha- has to be IID. So yeah, yeah. of course. <laughs> well, and that's the thing too is like it. It's sort of was just my my fascination with noisy data has been like for so long because it's just sort of like, that's just what we have to work with. Like there's no reality in which we're gonna be dealing with perfect data um, or perfect test situations, you know? So it's like, we always start with noisy data and just try to figure out what we can get from there. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. 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 
sounds good so uh thank you emily i think uh if anyone has any question this is the <laughs> kind of last call probably uh the uh, as i mentioned earlier the talk was co-sponsored by ieee young professionals uh, uh women in engineering and the uh, uh computational intelligence uh, affinity group so so the chairs i, I do see them there present here at the, attended the talk uh, it was very interesting thank you so much uh, uh yeah thank you is it is it okay to uh make like publicly share the video of the talk the, oh sure yeah. It, yeah but uh, uh yeah and also yeah. if possible can you uh, uh if it is okay then please provide us the slides so that we can also oh, sure, yeah. uh, provide okay. it along with that okay yeah absolutely i can send them to you Okay, uh, sound good. Uh, it was really nice uh, meeting you uh, after a yeah, while. Yeah, it was good to see you. <laughs> yeah, good to see you. Uh, so, yeah, with that, we can uh, call it a day. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, bye. Okay. Bye.